session. Uh, our first speaker is uh, Professor Mike Hermely from the University of Colorado Boulder. And he's going to continue our exploration of fractons. And today's talk is on coarse translation symmetry and exotic renormalization groups in fracton phases. So Mike, go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Taylor. Uh, and thanks to all the organizers for putting together this uh, really exciting meeting. It's always a pleasure to be back here at KITP. Um, and in fact, uh, one of the things that led me to start thinking about uh, the work that's turned into this talk, uh, which is currently still work in progress, was actually the invitation to come to this meeting. Um, I wanted to think about something uh, that had uh, had to do with sort of themes of, you know, the role of symmetry uh, in, you know, various interesting phases of phases of matter. Um, and I had done some work very explicitly on that some number of years ago, but not anything very recently. So I kind of started thinking in that direction, and then the story took a surprising turn. So that's only going to be clear actually later in the talk. Um, so, so the course translation symmetry part will actually come up a little bit, uh, a little bit later in the talk. Um, okay, but we'll get to that. Uh, and I will warn you that this will be an unapologetically theoretical talk. Uh, but I know we have a very broad audience here at this meeting, so I'll do my best uh, to make it accessible. Okay, so um, I'll start with just a little bit of review about uh, fractons. We already had some nice review of fractons in Shiz's talk before lunch. Um, I won't go into that much detail, uh, but what are fractons? So these are gap excitations uh, above the ground state of some quantum many body system, like a spin model. Uh, these phenomena, uh, at least in their simplest uh, guise, uh, only seem to occur in three spatial dimensions and higher. Uh, but we'll focus on three dimensions, okay? And so, so in fracton phases, there are gapped excitations of restricted mobility. So that means that if I have an excitation here, and I would like to get it to this point in space there, there is no local process by which I can accomplish that, okay? There's and it's not even just a matter of energy conservation. Um, there's just simply no local operator that you can act with in this oval-shaped region that will destroy this excitation over here and recreate it over there. However, uh, the sort of thing that might happen is that it is possible to destroy this excitation here and create three excitations uh, at the corners of this box. And uh, when that sort of thing happens, and that happens that precisely that happens in the X cube model that she introduced in the morning. Um, when that happens, an individual isolated such excitation is actually immobile. Uh, it won't move, but there's more complicated sort of cooperative mobility uh, where this excitation can split into three. Okay, so this, an excitation that has this sort of mobility is what we would call a fracton. It's individually immobile. There are other excitations that have some mobility, but their mobility is still restricted. There are line-on excitations that move along lines and plane-on excitations that move within planes. Okay, so, um, all right, uh, this is the X cube fracton model. Okay, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. Uh, so, but I just wanted to tell you that this is a model uh, of qubits or spin and a half spins that live on the links of the 3D simple cubic lattice, okay? And the Hamiltonian is a sum of commuting terms. Uh, these are you know, multi-body interaction terms, okay? This, uh, this is actually a product of 12 spin operators on the edges of a cube. Um, so the Hamiltonian is uh, not simple at all from the point of view of experimental realizability, but it's very simple from the point of view of theoretical solvability. This is a model that's actually very similar to the 2D toric code model, um, the arch archetypical model for a Z2 spin liquid. Okay. So it's in the model, it's a model sort of very much in the same spirit as the toric code model. It's a sum of commuting terms, uh, and it's, it's not hard to compute any property that you might be interested to know uh, about this model, okay? Um, and this model has all of the three types of excitations that I showed on the first slide. It has fracton excitations, line-on excitations, and plane-on excitations, okay? Um, there's another model whose Hamiltonian I won't write down uh, called Haas cubic code, or sometimes just the cubic code, um, which uh, has a somewhat more complicated Hamiltonian, but also in the same spirit. Uh, and that's a model where all of the non-trivial excitations are fractons. There are no line-on and plane-on excitations there. And uh, by now, there's actually uh, 
a vast landscape of examples. There are many, many examples of models uh, sort of like these, and some actually quite a bit more complicated. Um, and uh, we do not understand this landscape of models very well. Okay, it's a, it's a sort of big and uh, complicated uh, zoo, and some of the individual examples we understand quite well, but we don't really have a good sense of the uh, lay of the land. Okay, uh, and so that's really just what I want to take, what, what I want you to take away from this, right? That there are simple models in which these kind of phenomena occur. There are actually many of them. Uh, we don't have a good understanding of that uh, kind of landscape. So why is this, uh, why are these kind of phenomena interesting? Well, there are a number of different reasons that people have been interested in this, very complementary reasons, actually. Uh, and even people from, you know, traditionally different subfields of theoretical physics uh, are in, very interested in, in these topics. Uh, so one reason to be interested in fractons is uh, for their quantum information properties. So Haas code in particular uh, is an important system in the quest to figure out if it's possible to have a self-correcting uh, quantum memory in a three-dimensional system, okay? These systems have interesting constrained quantum dynamics. Um, uh, what I want to focus on in this talk is that fractons are a new class of quantum phases of matter, uh, and also somewhat uh, that they're related to exotic quantum field theories. What's exotic about these quantum field theories? Uh, one way of saying it is that they exhibit a uh, uh, phenomenon called UVIR mixing, which I may have a chance to say a little bit about from a condensed matter point of view later in the talk. Okay, but uh, it's kind of easy to say, uh, as theorists, when we discover something new, oh, this is a new class of quantum phases of matter. So, you know, can we uh, flesh that out a little bit? Why is this a particularly interesting new class of phases of matter? Because there is, I think, something particularly interesting about fracton phases. Um, and before I explain that, I want to make a uh, different but related point, which is that actually fracton phases are really hard for theorists. And I'll just sort of appeal to the historical record and I want to draw a contrast with topological phases uh, where um, if you think about the progress in theory over the last 15 years or so, there were some key early developments, in particular the discovery of topological insulators, uh, and then uh, short, not that long afterwards, classification of free fermion topological phases and this discovery of 1D SPT phases and their classification, and after those early developments, there was a very rapid explosion of progress where, uh, you know, where we as a community asked and uh, answered a lot of the basic questions about topological phases, and it's kind of surprisingly systematic way. And there are still many interesting open questions, uh, but a lot was figured out in a very short time, okay? But on the other hand, uh, here's a sort of rough uh, timeline of early developments in fractons. So they were first identified by Shimon way back in 2004. Uh, and actually, everybody ignored that work, pretty much. Uh, and not for any good reasons. Uh, the work should not have been ignored, but it, it sort of was. Um, and uh, it kind of got into people's radar screen more uh, when Ha uh, discovered his cubic code in 2011. And then um, a little bit more. More recently, in 2015 and 16, uh, some people, uh, including Sagar Vijay, who's here in the audience, you know, discovered uh, a number of much simpler models and also uh, brought an understanding of, uh, you know, kind of uh, brought more of a condensed matter perspective uh, to, to lots of issues in, in fracton physics. And that's what really sort of kick-started the field from a condensed matter theorist uh, point of view, okay? But that's now about seven years ago, uh, and a, a general theoretical framework for fracton phases still seems very far away, okay? So, so why is it taking so long, okay? Because uh, it is taking a lot longer than in topological phases. So, um, the sort of one sentence explanation of why I think it's taking a long time is that uh, fracton phases don't obey the usual relationships uh, among phases of matter, renormalization group, and effective quantum field theories that are kind of part of the bedrock of the way that we think about many things in condensed matter theory. Okay. Um, and and all, um, it, these are, in fact, a lot of these, uh, you know, and, and so in order to explain what I mean by that, I have to remind you what the conventional situation is. Okay. 
we often don't even think about this. Um, but the conventional situation is that we might be interested, let's say we're mainly interested in some phase of matter and its universal properties, which are just properties that are the same everywhere within the phase. And uh, this phase is connected via some kind of renormalization group to some effective continuum quantum field theory. And how are these, how do these relationships work? Well, the, uh, what should be true is that the universal properties of the phase are invariant under the operations that uh, define the RG, which I'll tell you about in a second. And really this tells us that the uh, universal properties of the phase are long wavelength and low energy properties, or at least they're related to such properties. And then those properties are encoded in the effective quantum field theory. Okay, and this picture is believed to hold for all gapped phases which don't have restricted mobility excitations. Okay. Um, and when it does hold, uh, that opens up very powerful tools, for example, topological quantum field theory, uh, which is part of what I think allowed us to make very rapid progress understanding topological phases. Okay. So this talk is going to be focused on this side of this picture, not so much on quantum field theories. So I want to go into a little bit more detail about what I mean by phases of matter um, and also RG. So phases of matter are equivalence classes on quantum systems, okay? Uh, there are ways of grouping a whole bunch of quantum systems together. Uh, and this, the equivalence relation is generated by two kinds of operations. One is continuous deformation. Here's a parameter space. G1 and G2 would be uh, coefficients of two terms in the Hamiltonian, like a magnetic field, something like that. Uh, these are regions of parameter space where, let's say, a uh, gap remains open. And if you have two points in this green region, they're connected by a path along which the gap remains open. But if you have a point in the yellow region and a point in the green region, there's no path connecting those two uh, that does not go through a phase transition, and so they would not be in the same phase. Okay. There's another operation which is also very important, um, which is that uh, if we have a system with a ground state psi, we're allowed to stack it with some uh, qubits uh, which are in a product state, just in an all up state. Okay. Um, and, you know, you might think of this as an operation that we introduced for mathematical convenience or something, and it does give us some mathematical convenience, but I really want to emphasize that this operation is physically motivated, just like the first one. It really comes from the fact that lattice models are always idealizations, um, of, uh, of, of systems that actually live in the continuum. And whenever we think about a lattice model, we're always ignoring some degrees of freedom, like empty bands or filled core levels. And we don't want our notion of what phase of matter we're in to depend on exactly what degrees of freedom we chose to ignore and what degrees of freedom we chose to include. Okay. So what about RG? Uh, well, this is really just the way that we organize our thinking about physics in terms of scales. Uh, the idea is that, you know, we have some short distance description of the physics and we eliminate short distance degrees of freedom. We coarse grain a little bit. And if we go very far, we might go from a lattice description to a continuum description. Okay. Uh, but that's all RG is. It's just a way of eliminating short, and there are many ways to do it technically, of course. It's just some way of eliminating short distance degrees of freedom. And it gives us a link between lattice models and effective quantum field theories. Uh, there's a particular kind of RG that plays an important role in this story, which is called entanglement RG. Um, and in fact, uh, in, in, you know, what, what we know is that there are actually some very simple models, lattice models, that are literally RG fixed points. Okay. Um, and typically this is something we expect to happen when there's an exactly solvable model where the Hamiltonian is a sum of commuting terms and the correlation length is zero. So this happens uh, in the toric code model. Okay. Um, and uh, the way entanglement RG works is that imagine, so imagine we have a um, L by L patch of 2D toric code. Uh, the first thing we can do is apply some local unitary operation, and we disentangle that toric code into a new toric code with linear size L over 2, which you can think of as living on a sparser lattice, and a bunch of decoupled qubits. Okay, so this is like our coarse-grained system. Uh, and then in the second step, we just eliminate these decoupled qubits in a product state. We integrate them out, okay? And now we get a new toric code uh, on a different, in this case, smaller system size, okay? 
Um, if we did this in an infinite system, rather than keeping track of the system size, we'd keep track of the lattice constant. Here it would be a, here it would be 2a, and then we could add another step where we rescale our units of space and we get back exactly where we started. Okay, so we actually would say that the toric code is, a, is an RG fixed point under this entanglement RG. All right. Okay, and, and the fact that the toric code is an RG fixed point, um, it kind of tells us, well, one thing it tells us, it, it gives us hope uh, that the, the universal properties of the toric code phase should be encoded in some kind of effective continuum quantum field theory. It doesn't tell us what that quantum field theory is. We know that uh, in other ways, but at least it gives us hope if we didn't already know what that theory was, uh, that, that there should exist some such theory. Okay. All right, so back to fractons. Uh, so what's different in fractons? Well, there's a developing picture uh, which I want to explain a little bit, um, and then actually revise, uh, that replaces the more conventional one that I started with, okay? So we have some fracton phase and its universal properties, and the thing that's clearest about this picture is that we need to change what we mean by renormalization group. So in order to do RG for fracton phases, in order to get an RG fixed point, we need some kind of exotic RG. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a little bit. Um, but another thing that comes up in this picture is that it's actually, uh, you know, a lot of thought in this subject has gone into the question of how actually do we need to define fract phases in the context of fracton systems. And it's not obvious that our usual definitions of phases, even though th that is a physically motivated definition, it is that way for a reason, it's not clear that that's the nicest definition to use, theoretically. Okay, so uh, what do I mean by exotic RG? So this came up also in Chiz's talk before lunch. Um, so let's take the X cube model, okay? So if we take a L by L by L cube of the X cube model, uh, we can apply a local unitary to that, and we can make it into a cube of half the linear size, uh, stacked with a bunch of 2D toric code layers in all three principal lattice directions, okay? Um, and normally, if we were doing standard RG, we would say, well, we just changed this system into something that looks very different, and that's not very helpful. This is never gonna be an RG fixed point um, maybe we'll give up. And, and in fact, you can make good arguments, good simple arguments, that the X cube model cannot be a fixed point of any conventional RG procedure, uh, simply because its ground state degeneracy depends on system size, actually. Um, but in foliated RG, uh, the idea is that we integrate out these 2D layers. And we sort of think of them as like our trivial qubits and we just get rid of them. And if we do that, we make the X cube model into a fixed point because then we just take the X, we get from the X cube model to another X cube model. Okay? Um, and this leads to uh, an associated notion of a new way to define phases, foliated fracton phases, where we think of these stacks of 2D layers as trivial. And so if we have a system A, we view that as being in the same phase as A stacked with a bunch of 2D layers, okay? So that, that notion of foliated fracton phases is supposed to go with foliated RG fixed points. Um, there's also a version of this exotic RG story for Haas code, okay? There what happens is that the cubic code uh, under, is, is equivalent under a local unitary to itself and something else called model B on smaller lattices, okay? And model B is some other fracton model which is very similar to the cubic code, okay? And uh, it, it has been explored uh, and is certainly useful for certain questions to uh, integrate out model B, right? So we could say integrate out model B, that makes the cubic code into an RG fixed point. However, uh, that seems like a weird thing to do um, because uh, model B is a fracton model with very similar properties to Haas code. Why would we integrate it out but not integrate out Haas code? They seem very similar. Um, and, uh, you know, this uh, has made me in the past actually very pessimistic, uh, at least on a certain angle of thinking about Haas code, and it, it's made me suspect that maybe it's an example of a phase that doesn't have any useful continuum limit at all, and maybe therefore is very hard to understand. Um, so to summarize what I think is kind of the current state of the art uh, for fracton phases, for coming up with a picture like this, so for certain fracton models, the X cube model and its many cousins, uh, 
uh, we, uh, we call those foliated fracton phases, uh, which I explained. And it's important that this is a coarser equivalence relation than standard phases. And, um, and those are fixed points under foliated RG. We don't really understand what goes over here. There's been interesting progress here, but I don't think we understand it very well. Um, okay, and there's a belief that standard fracton phases, phases defined as I did at the very beginning of the talk, are not associated with RG fixed points at all. Okay, and that's uh, that's maybe seems a little strange, but that's what uh, we've believed. Um, there have been some recent improvements and generalizations to the foliated RG that Shia and I and, and our collaborators uh, worked on pretty recently. Um, you can ask us about that later if you're interested, but that's not a story that I'll have time to tell today in this talk. Um, and you could ask, you know, this only applies to some fracton models. What about Haas code, for example? We could make a similar picture for Haas code, but if, as I was just saying, it's not totally clear if it actually makes sense at least not clear to me. Okay, so in the rest of the talk, I'm gonna revise this picture. Okay, so we'll replace foliated fracton phases with just any fracton phases, and we'll essentially be talking about standard phases, so we won't have a coarser equivalence relation than standard phases. And instead of foliated RG, we'll have something very similar. Uh, it's just a more general notion of exotic RG, which includes foliated RG as a special case. Okay, and so what's going to happen is that with just a minor twist on the standard definition of phases, um, the universal properties of fracton phases, pretty much standard ones, are actually RG invariant under some exotic RG. So the, the revision here is not so much to the RG, but it's actually uh, revisiting the idea that we need some coarser kind of equivalence relation on systems over on the left-hand side. And so the association between foliated fracton phases and foliated RG is actually, I would say, not so clear. That's what we've assumed. We've assumed those two things go together, but now I actually don't think so. Uh, I still think foliated fracton phases are important for other reasons. Um, and uh, the other thing I want to say is that this revised picture applies to Haas code and uh, actually to a very large class of fracton models. Okay, so now finally, uh, you know, we get to something having to do with lattice symmetry, right? Uh, so um, if we think about sort of a different question. Uh, you know, we, we just say, uh, we want to kind of describe the properties of fracton phases. Uh, we want to be able to characterize them somehow. A key property that jumps out at us from the beginning is this restricted mobility. We'd like to be able to describe that in a precise way, theoretically. And uh, the only way I think that we really know how to do that is to assume that we have translation symmetry and then use that as a tool to describe the mobility of excitations, right? So, you know, we need to ask questions like, what happens if I destroy this excitation here and put it in these three places, okay? But, you know, destroying this excitation here and putting it over there implies that there's a way to compare the excitation here to the excitation there. And without translation symmetry, it's not clear how we do that comparison at all. Okay. There may be other ways to do it, but translation symmetry is a, is a nice way to do it. However, there's a big disadvantage, uh, which is that if we just assume translation symmetry, there's a lot of unwanted, uh, from this point of view, extra information that comes along for the ride that has nothing to do with restricted mobility. Okay, um, And this uh, also shows up just in ordinary topological phases under the heading of symmetry enriched topological phases. In fact, there will be a talk tomorrow from Xu Yang Song, where I think uh, at least part of the talk will be telling us about translation symmetry enriched Z2 spin liquids. So that's an example of these kind of phenomena that uh, I would like to get rid of for the purposes of this talk. So how can we do that? Um, well, there's a compromise that we can make. That's kind of the key idea, is that we allow some limited breaking of translation symmetry. Okay. And the idea is that we have a system with some translation symmetry, and we just enlarge the unit cell by a finite amount. So here we're doubling the linear size of the unit cell. Okay, um, and it turns out you can argue that uh, for translation for translation symmetry enriched topological phases, at least in 2D, you can make a simple argument 
that this gets rid of all of that extra symmetry enrichment information, but this still lets you talk about mobility because when you're talking about mobility of excitations, you only really care about motion of excitations over large distances, and uh, this kind of coarsening of the translation symmetry still lets you move things over large distances, which is really all we care about. So um, what this leads one to do is try to define a slightly different kind of equivalence relation uh, on uh, translation invariant gapped quantum systems. Um, and we actually work with infinite systems. Um, it's a little easier to think about that, okay? And um, there are many technical details here that uh, I'm completely glossing over, uh, but roughly speaking, there are four kinds of operations. Two of them uh, are operations that I already talked about, continuous deformation and stacking with trivial product states. Um, we also want to be able to forget some of the translation symmetry, that's this coarsening, right? We just don't worry about the very short distance translations. And another operation that turns out to be important uh, is a rescaling operation, where we treat two systems where the only difference is the choice of the lattice constant as equivalent, okay? Um, and actually, that last operation is really crucial, and it, uh, it differs from the perspective of some uh, earlier works. Um, and there are two ways to justify it. Uh, since it's crucial, it's good to have more than one way to justify it. One way to justify it is just to say, look, if I give you some lattice spin model um, and the spins are an angstrom apart versus if I have the same Hamiltonian and the spins are two angstroms apart, who cares? These are just, it's really the same system. Why do we care about the precise distance between the spins? So that's one point of view. Then we just declare this should be an equivalence operation. The other point of view is to, if you don't believe that, um, there's this, uh, you know, what we can imagine is that the degrees of freedom, uh, they're actually living in continuous space, and we could imagine deforming our crystal, suppose we apply pressure to the crystal, then uh, all of the lattice sites will get a little bit closer, or if we apply negative pressure, they'll get a little bit farther away, uh, and so you can actually imagine accomplishing, accomplishing rescaling by sliding lattice sites around, uh, and that's an idea of lattice homotopy introduced by these authors. So that's another way to justify this operation. I'll skip this technical comment. Um, so if we take this uh, sort of idea and apply it to the X cube model, what happens? Um, well, if we take the X cube model and double the unit cell, uh, then we know, this was already well known, just expressing in a different language, that the X cube model with lattice constant A uh, is actually in the same phase, in this sense, as the same X cube model stacked with a bunch of toric code layers, okay? There are actually two steps here. First, you would have a lattice constant of 2A on the right, and then you rescale, so there's some rescaling involved here, okay? Um, and then we can compare this to what happens under foliated RG, where first we apply a local unitary, and uh, the X cube model goes to itself stacked with some 2D toric code layers, and we double the lattice constant. And then we integrate out the 2D toric code layers, and then we rescale, okay? But the point is that the two systems on every, uh, on both sides of every one of these RG operations uh, live in the same phase in this coarse translation invariant sense. And so because the RG operations all preserve the phase of the system, uh, then, um, then it means that all universal properties of the phase that contains the X cube model uh, have to be RG invariant, because you, those universal properties, by definition of being universal, they have to be the same for all of these systems. Okay. I'll give examples uh, very briefly of some universal properties of that kind in a little bit. Uh, but first I want to just say that this can be generalized so um, suppose we have a system where if we enlarge the unit cell by some amount, uh, it's equivalent to itself stacked with some other system. So for example, A could be Haas code and B could be model B. Uh, but actually a great many fracton models satisfy this kind of uh, bifurcation property, uh, which is what people call it. Um, and so this suggests an RG procedure where we integrate out B and then A becomes a fixed point. Uh, and other people said that before, but the new thing uh, is that now uh, we have this argument uh, 
that the universal properties of the coarse translation invariant phase containing A are invariant under this exotic RG, where we integrate out B. Okay. And uh, so this applies to Haas code. And I found this extremely surprising because I didn't expect that RG to have anything to do with the universal properties of Haas code. Uh, but apparently it does. And in fact, if we want to think about the universal properties of Haas code um, in terms of some kind of RG uh, or RG fixed point, this is exactly the kind of RG that we should be thinking about. There's an interesting question that comes up here, which is to what extent is B unique? Um, which you can ask me about later if you're interested. Um, let me just close uh, with some uh, quick comments on what kinds of uh, properties of these coarse, you know, what, what kinds of universal properties can phases as defined in this way actually have, okay? So kind of a key point is that you're allowed to use translation symmetry to define whatever property you're interested in, but your property has to be robust to enlarging the unit cell. Okay. So, and it, here's an example, which is an important example. So suppose we have some excitation F, which is pictured here, and then suppose we translate it along some uh, lattice vector T, right? And so these are different translates of F, and there's a whole integer sequence of these. So we say that this excitation has restricted mobility along the direction T if all of these excitations are of distinct type meaning that there's no local process that can take one into another. If there was a local process, that would be a string operator that could take one of these and move it over by some amount. Okay. So this excitation has restricted mobility in the T direction. And in fact, uh, a precise definition of a fracton phase is simply that it's a phase that has at least one restricted mobility excitation. Okay. And this property is coarse translation invariant because if it's true that all of these excitations are of different type, then if you double the unit cell, well, f and t squared f and t to the minus 2f, they're also of different type. Okay, so this property is coarse translation invariant, and it also doesn't change if you move parameters around. Um, there are lots of other examples. Um, there are also examples having to do with statistical processes of fractons. Uh, there's actually a paper that uh, uh, will come out uh, tonight on the archive just to advertise it, which is not really related to this story directly, but it's about the fact that fractons can have non-trivial self-exchange statistics even though they're immobile. Um, and uh, Nat, one of my co-authors, is also here. Um, okay. and, and that's an example of a property that's coarse translation invariant. So actually, uh, one thing that's kind of important to mention is there's an interesting application of these ideas to the X cube model and some variant of the X cube model that actually dates back to 2019 uh, in some work I did with my student, Shriya Pai. Uh, and in fact, the seed of the idea to use coarse translation invariance as a tool to think about fracton phases actually came from the work that we did. We were only thinking about it in the context of this example, um, but there was, uh, but some, some of the early ideas were there. Um, and so uh, here's the story very briefly. Uh, it's possible to construct the X cube model out of coupled toric code layers. There's a way to do that. Um, and you can also imagine coupling other kinds of layers. In particular, you can couple layers uh, of the toric code's cousin, the doubled semion state. And you can get a so-called semionic X cube model. So later, um, these authors showed that the X cube and semionic X cube models are actually in the same foliated fracton phase. If you allow to stack with 2D layers, there's no real no real difference between these models. However, um, these are distinct coarse translation invariant phases, and they're distinguished by statistics between line-on excitations. So there's a process where you can take two line-ons, which are the red dots, you can take one and move it out of the way of the other by splitting it into some other excitations. You can move this line-on to the position of the first one, and then you can move these three back to where the first one started, um, and this gives you a way to define a self-exchange statistics of line-ons, even though, you know, there's something interesting, which is that one has to split up to get out of the other one's way. Um, and, and so this actually uh, tells us, uh, well, the, the actual argument is rather technical, but this allows us to give, a, to, to show that, that this X cube model and the semionic X cube model are in different coarse translation invariant phases. Okay, so quick summary and outlook. Um, so, 
the kind of surprise here, at least to me, is that universal properties of more or less ordinary phases, uh, fracton phases, are, are associated with fixed points of uh, exotic renormalization groups. Okay, that's not how I expected uh, things to work. It's not how I thought things worked a few months ago. Um, and so I'm optimistic now, uh, which is also a change in my perspective, that these universal properties can actually be captured nicely in some continuum theories, which we might not, we probably haven't maybe quite constructed them yet. Uh, and the basic idea here is that these coarse translations should very nicely match onto continuum translations. Because in continuum field theory, we're used to the idea that continuous translation symmetry ignores all of the sort of short business, business of translations at the lattice scale. Okay? And there's a lot of work to do to understand coarse translation invariant properties and then characterize fracton phases in those terms. And another thing I want to emphasize is that if we want to understand Haas code, uh, and I think a lot of us who've been working on this subject would really like to understand Haas code better because it's still very mysterious after more than 10 years. Uh, it seems that better understanding model B um, is probably one of the keys to that. Uh, now that's not easy because model B is probably at least as hard to understand as Haas code, uh, but there may be some uh, useful perspective here that will eventually let us uh, make progress on what seems to be a quite challenging problem. Okay, thanks. Okay, we have about two minutes for questions. Um, thank you. It was a very nice talk. Uh, I have a two-part question. The first part is um, these fixed points that you obtain. Um, should I think of them as UV or IR fixed points? And the second question is, um, Based on what, like when we are eliminating system B, in a conventional RG, uh, we eliminate high energy modes. So here, that distinction is absent, it seems to me. So what is the okay. basis? Yeah. yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, 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 let me, I'm not sure if my answer will be separated into two parts. But um, I mean, I think we roughly want to think of these fixed points as IR fixed points. But in fact, this is exactly the comment that I wanted to make about UVIR mixing and what I think it means, right? So in, in usual RG, we're just integrating out high energy modes. But here, we're integrating out some ultra low energy degrees of freedom as well. And that's exactly what's non-standard about the RG. Um, and so what, what this exotic RG is kind of telling us is that um, the, the universal properties of fracton phases uh, are not simply IR properties. They're, it's sort of certain IR properties are in some sense maybe should be thought of as non-universal. Uh, so s some of the IR information, I think that's probably the way I look at it, is that some of the IR information uh, is actually not really, it's not there in the RG fixed point because we're integrating it out. And it's also not part of the universal properties of the phase. Um, and that's kind of, you know, it, maybe that's a de one way of defining what we might mean by UVIR mixing, um, you know, where, where uh, usually we just integrate out UV things. Here we're integrating out both UV and IR things. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the nice talk. Uh, so, Yes, I have a conceptual question. The, um, uh, you know, it's a question of, uh, and you brought this up too, uh, what does it mean for two different states to be in the same phase of matter? Right? Uh, you brought it up in your talk. Um, now, you, uh, maybe let me just illustrate it with your last example, this uh, semionic X cube model and the regular X cube model. Now, uh, so there are different Hamiltonians for which these are ground states. Now, normally, I would have said that they are in the same phase if I can add some perturbation and tune from one ground state to the other ground state. Right? But if the rules of the game are that we're going to regard adding these 2D topological orders as trivial, and maybe in these two different, fixed, two different phases you added different kinds of 2D topological order. So then there's no way that different experiments, I tune from one Hamiltonian to the other, you always go through a phase transition. But somehow that phase transition is occurring in the trivial sector 
So do you regard these as, in the end you were saying that these should be regarded as two. Yeah, okay, so I want to clarify something, right? So the way that I would like to define phases, right? There have been a lot of different definitions of phases that we've used in this subject, right? But the definition that I'm advocating for is actually a very standard, very conservative definition, right? So, so it actually, which, you know, surprisingly seems to be actually good enough to connect to RG and other things we might like to do in fracton physics. So definitely I would consider the semionic X cube and doubled semionic X cube, the, the X cube model and semionic X cube model are definitely different phases under, under this definition, right? And in this definition, this operation of adding 2D layers is not allowed. The only thing that you're allowed to do is add some, some uh, qubits in a product state. You, you, you can do that, right? So this is distinct from the definition of foliated fracton phases where uh, we treat any 2D layer as a free resource, right? So the interesting thing is that this rather conventional definition of a phase where we only allow pretty standard operations like tuning the Hamiltonian continuously and stacking some trivial qubits, this seems to be associated with very unconventional RG where we, in fracton phases, where we actually do integrate out non-trivial 2D layers. But that's not one of our phase equivalence operations, right? So there's a distinction between the operations that we do when we're doing RG and the, and the operations that define the equivalence relation that gives us our notion of phases. So actually my question is very much related to Sentil's. <clears throat> so basically what Sentil is asking, and I, what I wanted to ask is how do you define the adiabatic principle here? Do you, do you just change something in the Hamiltonian or do you allow for changes in the um, volume? Because if you do that, then clearly they have different ground state degeneracy, right? So, and, and, and what, if, if you, if in RG you have to integrate out uh, um, different energy scale degrees of freedom, then how can I, how can I define a low energy sort of adiabatic principle for these phases? Yeah, so the, first of all, I mean, so there's a, there's a few different equivalence operations you need to consider. So one of them is just the usual adiabatic continuity, right? So that's completely standard. That's defined in the usual way. Now, the thing which is non-standard, so I'm gonna kind of zoom in on the, the, what I think is the most non-trivial part of your question, uh, is, the, is changing the volume. Okay, so that's allowed. And, and people might object and say, wait, if you're ch you can't change the volume because you're changing the ground state degeneracy. But I actually very much disagree with that point of view because what I would say is two things. First of all, phases are only defined in the infinite volume limit. And it's actually better to just work with infinite systems, which I think in condensed matter physics, we sort of underappreciate that there's actually very rigorous mathematical technology to do that. So it's actually quite well defined. We often think we can only talk about an infinite system as a limit of finite systems, but that's actually completely not true. We can choose to work with an infinite system, okay? Um, and, and ground state degeneracy is very tricky because it actually depends on boundary conditions in very subtle ways. So you can actually make the ground state degeneracy of the X cube model not grow with system size uh, by choosing boundary conditions in a certain way. It doesn't have to grow with system size. So, uh, so, so I don't think there's a, um, so, so it is true, you know, in some sense that the, the, the only, the, the most radical thing, I still feel like this is a pretty conservative definition of phases, but the most radical thing about it is this idea that we're allowed to change the volume. Definitely, there are previous definitions that would dis, that disagree with this and say you're not allowed to do that. But I think that we should allow that as, as an equivalence operation. But then just, just as a 10 second comment, then we come back to the second point of centers, which I also agree with, then while well, I agree with you that they're defined only in phases are defined only in thermodynamic limit, you'll have no chance of finding one of these things numerically uh, if if you adopt that point of view, right? Uh, no, but I think that's what I was order. thinking about the other definition of phases, right? Where we allow to stack with these non-trivial 2D layers. But that's precisely what I'm not allowing to do, right? That's not part of the definition. Hi, I want to ask a more, uh, maybe unrelated to your core point, but related to your technology of this coarse translation symmetry. So I think you said that it, the goal of it was to kind of get rid of um, interesting but uninteresting to you, like symmetry in which topological phases. Um, and the symmetry in which topological phases that I have on the top of my head, it would get rid of, but I'm wondering how general that is. Like other, 
could there be, like, do we know for sure that it gets rid of every kind of symmetry in which topological phase? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think in, in, for gap phases in 2D, there's a general argument that you can make, uh, which is based on describing, uh, you know, those SET phases um, in terms of unitary modular tensor categories. And there we have a general theory of symmetry enrichment, and we can sort of, we can use that theory to run a pretty simple argument, actually, which I, I can tell you and about later. And that theory works for translation but symmetry, too? It, 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 also, it also works for translation symmetry, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, but, um, you know, it, it's not uh, totally clear what happens in higher dimensions. Uh, and in fact, uh, there's an interesting example uh, that, uh, that in fact I learned about from Senthil. That's one of the things, other things that got this work started is Senthil's question to me, is this example a fracton phase? Uh, and so this example is you take a U1 gauge, I, I don't have time to explain the whole example, but the example is actually based on a rather conventional U1 gauge theory that's sort of decorated a little bit. But if you lose the translation symmetry, um, then, uh, you know, the, the low energy theory is, it, it's, it's, it's almost just a, just a ordinary, completely ordinary U1 gauge theory. Um, and uh, nonetheless, uh, that, uh, that example has a restricted mobility excitation as I defined it. And so it, it would, you know, it would count as a, so the, in some sense I handled the question by definition. I would say, oh, that's a fracton phase. It's not an SET phase. <laughs> Um, but, I mean, you could look at it either way. You could also look at it as an SET phase where the symmetry enrichment doesn't get killed off by coarse translations. Yeah, so I'm happy to explain that example later uh, offline. Okay, great. Let's thank Mike again.